Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek VR News for Sunday, November 6th, 2016. Let's jump right into VR. Start with a bit of preamble, the old uh, controversial top 10 games list. Top 10 games lists or top lists of anything are always fairly personal, subjective, opinionated creations, right? They're constructs that include all of those labels. And yet, you know, they're fun, right? But they always create passionate dialogue, right? And you can see that in the comments section, right? Not only were I, was I selecting games for one platform, I was looking at four. And at a glance, it would appear that, wow, Epix must not like the Gear VR. There's no games represented. I like the Gear VR just fine. It's just, to me, there's no game in the top 10. But you know what? Had that been a top 30 list, yeah, there'd probably be a Gear VR title or two in that list. It just didn't extend down to 10, right? That made it a bit more difficult. But comments were great. Uh, good suggestions for games that I hadn't played. So I've added those to the mythical, never shrinking, always growing trademarked the list. So I've added those on there and games that were mentioned that had this been a top 15, 20 or 30 list absolutely would have been present. But again, the challenge for me was sweeping across four platforms. Uh, some of them having exclusive titles that others didn't and then coming up with the top 10, right? So it was fun. I enjoyed it and really appreciated the comments on that one, guys. So uh, cheers and thanks. All right, next one is a game from an indie Australian company called Samurai Punk. And the game is called The American Dream. And, you know, my view is I've got a pretty raunchy sense of humor for the most part. I mean, most of that doesn't come across on this channel um, because I want it to be an inclusive channel, right? But, uh, you know, even with games, if, if there was a game making fun of Canadians, and trust me, that's pretty damn easy to do, or Dutch people, or hell, Germans even, I'm all of those, <laughs> I'd, I'd be okay with it. I can separate the humor, you know, uh, if it's malicious and it's hateful, well, that's a different thing. But if it's humor, fine, whatever, right? Well, the American dream is a look at 1950s Americana, right? in a crazed gun setting. In other words, every everyday task, job, hobby is done using firearms. Baby in a crib, baby is dual wielding pistols. <laughs> Taking out the garbage, you do it with pistols, right? Uh, shopping, bring your rifle and semi-automatic along. So every aspect of the 1950s America that they're showing is, you know, done with the extreme kind of gun angle in mind, right? So it doesn't bother me. Then I'm not American. I guess that would be for you Americans to decide if that bothers you or not. To me, I look at that as just a game. Uh, I don't think it's being specifically hateful. Like I said, I just think it's, it's taking something and, you know, absurdist humor kind of to the extreme. But uh, it's going to be released mid-2017 on all major VR platforms. Uh, you would think that would include Sony, uh, but certainly Rift and Vive. Uh, no, no idea on the price yet, but supposedly they have shown this to Americans and it has been fairly well received, or at least hasn't been received negatively yet. So anyways, interested in uh, American opinions on that. What do you guys think? And of course, you don't have to be American to have an opinion on it. You heard mine after all. But uh, yeah, I, specifically, I would like to hear if you are American. All right, for the news, Google really throwing their hat in the ring with web VR support. So uh, Megan Lindsay, she is the web VR product manager at Google. She's indicated that they are going to be rolling out a beta for Android Chrome this December, so upcoming December next month, with a stable release to launch in January. And then later in the year, they're going to do the same thing with the Windows Chrome for Rift and Vive, etc., uh, for Chrome for Windows. And then after the beta, do a stable release. So be interesting. Everything is being done to the WebVR 1.1 spec. So again, you can expect a beta next month for Android and then a stable release in January. 
Next headline, this one, you know, just fascinating. I'm a guy with many, many hobbies and linguistics is, you know, both a hobby and was an academic pursuit of mine. I just love language and the study of language. And this is about students, Cree students uh, specifically, uh, and the Cree are a native Canada with an awesome language, an awesome culture and an awesome history if you don't include the last couple hundred years, but in terms of their, you know, existence and survival on this continent. It's really freaking fascinating. Plus one of my favorite of the native mythos, right? Some that are very familiar to like the Haida Gwaii here on the West Coast, but others that are uniquely Cree. And what the Cree school board has done here is worked with a VR company to create a Cree language program in virtual reality. And why that is so awesome to me uh, is, I mean, look at me personally, I'm married to a Filipina. She speaks Filipino or better put Tagalog, right? Which is her language, my native language, Dutch, but together we speak English, right? So Dutch dies with me, Tagalog dies with her, English and its power of assimilation takes over and that's the language my daughter will speak and likely pass on to her kids and so forth, right? And, you know, we know the major language groups, like you take Europe, for example, you've got your Slavic, your Germanic, your um, Italic Latin Romance languages in the South. Then you've got pockets of things, right? You've got Finnish, which doesn't really uh, fit in under those three groupings, etc. But you also have Celtic. And if you look at the Celtic language, just in the UK Isles, right? I mean, there's stories of success, but there's, there's a pretty bad history in terms of language extinction, right? Supposedly, there's 50,000 people in Scotland in the North that can still speak Gaelic, but it's dying. Uh, Wales has done a decent job. They've got broadcasts in Welsh. You learn it in school. Um, and, you know, the numbers are fairly stable. I think some statistics even show it as growing. But it's against almost all odds, right, in the presence of the powerful English. And despite horrible things in history, like the Welsh knot, which was meant to root out that language, right, and have it literally go extinct. So it survived despite that. And others like Cornish, unfortunately, didn't. And it's all but extinct now. And same thing in Ireland, right? You've got pockets of Gaelic in the, in the far west, you know, the, the, the enclaves where it lasts. Um, you know, your typical person on the streets of Dublin might know a few words, but by and large, it's not something that every speaker speaks, even though the accent that they have is there as a result of their ancestors having spoken that Celtic language, right? So it's just fascinating. Take that, apply it back to what's happening here in Canada, which again, you know, the, the native language is not getting any easier. The onslaught of English is so powerful that it seems almost inevitable that's going to be lost, right? And what makes it more tragic to me for their culture is that it wasn't a written culture. It was an oral culture, an oral history. So preserving that is a huge challenge. So what a, what a cool concept. I love that. Is it ultimately going to be successful? I really hope so. Um, but if you look at the program, I've included the link. It's to CBC and it shows these kids and the look of wonder on their face, right? Going through the forest you know, hunting with a bow and arrow, throwing sticks, and learning the Cree equivalents, right? It's just what an awesome way, because they are at that age. And that's another fascinating thing in, in linguistics, where the human brain can learn language without accent. And it's when you hit the mid-teens, usually, for most people, the percentages just skyrocket. They go exponentially higher. The older you get, the more difficult it gets to shake your accent, right? So super fascinating. Check it out. Um, like I said, I know I spent a little time on that, but just to me, that is one of the most powerful things that virtual reality that I've seen it do. And I've seen it do a lot the last few months. So very, very cool. All right. Next story, Adobe uh, at their uh, event. So I believe this is a uh, annual event. Yeah. Called Max. They showed off 
uh, VR editing features in their Adobe Premiere package. Now, the guy who took the stage, his name is uh, Stephen Deverdi, he showed how jumbled those 360 frames can be just in the editor. And then, you know, went through using a tool called the Rotational Alignment Tool, how their software, and the, pro the project is called Clover VR. That's kind of the, the code name that they're using or the project name for this um, enhanced functionality in Adobe Premiere. And he showed how you're able to align and actually work on that footage almost as seamlessly as if it was traditional uh, scenes that you were splicing together. So very, very cool. No word on when that tool set will go mainstream, but for users of Adobe Premiere, uh, specifically those who are doing VR stuff. Good to hear that that's coming down the pipe. Next story. This one is fascinating. Just <laughs> again, okay, so I get all geek out over the, the language thing, right? That's one thing. And we've talked about almost every single sense on this channel. Touch, right? Via haptic feedback. Uh, audio, uh, you know, the sense of vision is the obvious one that VR, you know, uh, works with. We haven't really talked about taste. And, you know, for most people, that's going to bring images literally of licking each other's HMDs, which is pretty damn sick and disturbing. That's not where we're going with this. But there are some uh, universities in Asia. So the National University in Singapore and students in uh, Japanese universities that are working on creating digital solutions for that sense, kind of the final frontier of senses, if you will, for VR. And one group created what's called a digital lollipop to emulate different tastes. And it's basically a spoon embedded with electrodes. You put your tongue to it. Again, probably not something you're sharing. Maybe if it's an intimate program, right, with your uh, spouse or partner, whatever, knock your socks off. But for the most part, you're not going to a convention or a VR arcade and licking digital lollipops. Probably not going to happen. But the study is the fascinating part. And using those electrodes, they're able to create salt, sour, bitterness. Sweetness is the tough one. But they've been able to, to do that uh, by alternating temperatures, and they can kind of mimic sweetness. That's not the only part of, you know, there's the sense of, of taste, yes, but there's more to taste than just the flavor. There's also the texture, right? They've even got that covered. So they've got kind of to the, um, the masseter muscle here on the top of your jaw, they've placed electrodes and stimulating that muscle can create the sensation like it's more elastic, the food, harder to chew, etc. Now, obviously it's pretty damn primitive at this point and you don't want to get in a situation where you're, you know, playing a VR game is like electric shock therapy, right? That's not what's being proposed here. Rather, just that the study is going in that direction, that hopefully one day it will be something that's hygienic, seamless, you know, and can create the sense of taste. Like, that would just be amazing. But I still think, you know, while this is a promising start, we are a long ways off from making that practical. All right, guys, that is it for the news today. As always, cheers and definitely catch you on the VR flip side.